there was a business reporter in the coffee house one day and he was interviewing other businesses, not us, but I happened to be working behind the counter and I would, as I was serving drinks, make comments about our business and what, what it took to really open and stay in business at that time. And we were not even a year old. And I happened to mention that we slept on the shelving in the basement of our coffee house and we would take turns because of the number of hours we were working and we only had one employee and one day Aaron went downstairs and did not know that at different times we were taking naps and all she saw was an arm coming off a shelf and came back upstairs and uh, the comment made to me was, I don't need to know everything, but a little more information would be helpful. So as I was sharing this with the business reporter, the next day he called and said, I think you all are, are my story. And we discussed all the research we had done and the paper comes out and the headline is The Slab of Success. And it's about sleeping on the shelving and that it was like living in a morgue. But it really reinforced that what does it take to to create a business and what are you willing to sacrifice? And I don't even like the word sacrifice. You know, to what lengths will you go to make sure your business launches and many years later stay in business? Hey everyone, I'm Palmer Higgins and welcome to the Big Time Small Business Podcast. I interview owners, operators, and founders of the small businesses you see every day but don't hear enough about. We talk about the obstacles they have faced, the successes they have earned, and where their business is going to inspire and inform you in your own career. On this episode, I talk with Mary Ellen Lindemann, co-founder and community builder of Coffee by Design, a Maine-based community coffee house and wholesale roastery that will roast over 550,000 pounds of coffee this year. Approaching their 25th anniversary, CBD has been through three waves of coffee house competition and has learned how to start, grow, and sustain a successful organization along the way. Mary Allen is steadfast in her company's commitment to steady, sustainable, and responsible growth to the point where she says no more than yes and is comfortable no longer being the first in an effort to be the best. She engages in a level of honest introspection only an entrepreneur of her tenure could accomplish and has sustained an enthusiasm for her business that is emblematic of a mission-driven founder. All right, Mary Ellen Lindemann, uh, co-founder and community builder of Coffee by Design here in Portland, Maine. Thanks a lot for being on the show, Big Time Small Business. Well, thank you for having me here. I'm I'm very pleased to tell you about the history of what has been known as a... uh, now a grandparent of a business, I guess. Yeah. So uh, you're coming up on your 25th anniversary. Uh, so this is the the longest tenured business on the show thus far. And for me, near and dear to my heart uh, in my day job, I spend most of my time talking to business owners and founders and operators of businesses older than 10 plus years. Um, and for you guys at 25 years, tons of history there. Uh, and I really want to get into sort of juxtaposing what it was like when you first started in 1994 to today. But I'm going to start way back when in 1994, uh, when you started Coffee by Design, Portland was not what it was today or what it is today. So can you take us back to 94 and, and what got you interested in starting a coffee shop in Portland, in an area of Portland that mm-hmm. I think most people would have called CD at best? You mean the porn district? Yes. <laughs> no, it's actually, we need to go a little bit uh, ahead of 94 because it really was in the late 80s when the recession had hit many downtowns, including Portland, quite quite hard. And my business partner and I were living here in Portland. We were young professionals. I'm a marketing specialist and he's a landscape architect. And we realized that the economy was not going to improve and that trying to build a life here was not going to be what we had envisioned. And so we made the decision to leave Portland, and it was a flip of a coin. Uh, we were either going to go to Seattle or San Francisco, and I don't even know why we chose those cities. Was we Seattle, probably was had Seattle done, heads or was Seattle tails. Well, we let's just say we landed in Seattle. <laughs> okay. Which uh, at the time was good for two reasons. One is uh, we really were not into the coffee industry, but we landed in Seattle at a time when Starbucks was still very young and new and exciting things were happening. But also the week we moved to Seattle, San Francisco had its earthquake that was really significant. So life would have been very different. 
but we did we did end up in Seattle and and both ended up with large firms and I was given the assignment to research what was now being called the specialty coffee industry because something was happening in an industry that had actually seen decline. My generation, my age, we were not drinking coffee. We were drinking soft drinks. That was the rise of soft drinks. So I would bring my research home and I would meet really cool companies that are all um, still in existence, but most of them are owned by Starbucks actually, but Toro Fazzi and Italia and Caravalli Coffee and SBC. And I would bring my research home and, and Alan, who was very involved in environmental and agricultural design was fascinated. And so we would read the research and I would talk about what I was doing, but then we would come back to Maine to visit family and friends and kept on talking about why isn't someone doing something about our downtown? It's 40% vacancy rate. And why aren't they doing something? And it was a three-year period of us being out in Seattle and doing well professionally and coming back here when almost the light bulb moment of who exactly are they? So it's a daunting task to come back. You talk about 40% vacancy rates. You started up your first coffee shop in what was then the porn district of Portland. Uh, what, what made you and Alan together say, you know, we're going we're gonna to bring this back to Portland. It's going to be successful. Was it purely mission driven? Was it, we're gonna, was it entrepreneurial driven? Was it, uh, was it a combination? You know, what, what, what gave you the confidence or the, the guts to really make that leap cross country mm-hmm. and settling down in Portland? You know, a confidence. I wouldn't say confidence. It might be stupidity in certain ways, but, but actually it wasn't after three years. We came right back to Portland. We, we thought Portland, we wanted to come back to Maine, but uh, people we really respected here discouraged us, felt that the concept we had was too progressive and would not be supported. So we spent an additional almost three years traveling around New England. And as difficult as that time was, it really helped us research and build the vision of what exactly were we looking to create here. And I will give Alan full credit. It, it was going to be his his business. I was going to be the helper. And as the idea really grew, it really turned into how do you define a community coffee company? So after living in Burlington, Vermont, and then we were in Providence, Rhode Island, and we looked in Boston, it really was a phone call from an artist friend who said, I have the perfect location for you on Congress Street in Portland. And we came and it all really fell together that this was where we were meant to be. We were meant to come home, if you will. We were meant to really help rebuild our community and that we felt that people were really misjudging Maine, that it's a little bit more sophisticated than people know, and that's still true today, that people don't realize people here are hardworking, they have ideas, they have guts and courage, and and they create great businesses here. Something that I'm hoping this podcast will will address, Uh, I've made a point of interviewing people who are in a very tight geographic footprint in the beginning of of the podcast, to sort of emphasize that point that there are great stories here in Maine, here in Portland. Um, so you, you talk about the sort of the, the journey uh, to get to Portland. How much of the vision had you and Alan sketched out when you started that in the beginning of that three-year quest around New England and how much of it evolved over those three years? And, and to the extent it evolved, what evolved? I think that first of all, it was going to just be a cart which at the time was a very unique concept inside office buildings. So we thought we would be the first. But as we really looked at the idea of what we really felt, what what is the purpose of a coffee house? You know, it brings people together. It brings community together. The the initial, you know, gem of an idea, this tiny little thing just really grew. And so when we saw the space and started really looking at, was that the neighborhood we should be in? A couple of things we noticed, first of all, is sitting in our car and, and Alan was doing you know, foot traffic counts. And as we spoke to people in that particular block, the 600 block of Congress Street, there was an energy that was really starting to build and it was local ownership. And I think about things that over the years that have happened that just have presented themselves that looked like challenges at the time, which ended up being incredible opportunities for us to get even more engaged in the community, to grow as individuals, and to really embrace the people who work with us and our neighbors. Um, I think about, you know, when we opened the Congress Street store, the State Theater had just been renovated. It had been it had become a porn theater. 
and it had been purchased and was restored to its original glory. And and then we had Bella Bella, Jim Ledoux, who's no longer with us. The first open kitchen concept restaurant was there in Terra Firma, the local shoe store, and dropped me a line, our local card store. That were, you know, was a, owned by a gay couple. We were the only block at the time that was perceived as safe if you were gay. Um, in fact, one of the amusing stories as we were build, doing our build out of the Congress Street Coffee House, Alan and a friend of ours were doing the build out and I was working. So we had money coming in. And when I arrived right before the opening, people wanted to know who I was because they assumed Alan and his friend were a couple. And so who's she? <laughs> and it's like, well, <clears throat> I'm actually the other half of the business. But but I think that what really it instilled in me is the importance of local ownership and uniqueness and what we bring to a, a town. It's something I think about all the time as Portland grows. Sure. But I think at the time it was a magical opportunity to see how can we bring a downtown back. And it is through local ownership and people who are entrepreneurial in nature. If If you are told, no, you can't do that. If it stops you, then you're not an entrepreneur. You want to show people, I can do that, and I'll show you the way. Sure. So a couple of things I'm going to I'm gonna pick up on there. Uh, first, I think, is that that entrepreneurial spirit. Um, I think when you, when you flash forward to a point 25 years later, you, you tend to overlook that entrepreneurially, entrepreneurial ride in the beginning. Um, and it sounds... It sounds great when you just give the the synopsis of we had this vision and and we saw the opportunity, um, but what's lost in there is is a lot of the research that went into it. Are right? you talking about sitting there in your car, taking foot traffic counts by hand? Um, so can you talk about all the research that went in, all the work that went into just building the idea and getting started on day one? Because it, it's not it's not like you guys just jumped in willy nilly. Well, and because of our Age is a business. I can share. We did not have the internet. We did not have cell phones. It was a big deal when we got our first pager. Um, so research, you really did have to go out there and go to libraries and call people on the phone and request information be sent. And, and so there was, we actually still have the file boxes. We have boxes and boxes of research. And how do we refine what our vision was? And what Alan brought was the technical aspects of coffee to the company and, and how he would envision the look of it. What I brought as I came on board, originally it was going to be just a part-time basis, but then it really became clear that my vision of how do you create a community coffee company? What does that mean? Uh, my degree being in poetry, I really think a lot about the arts and the influence the arts had and the conversations held in coffee houses historically. And so it, it was sort of the melding of the craft, the science, the art of coffee and bringing it all together in one space and bringing it into a neighborhood that had been forgotten. Sure. So let, let's talk about the early days of, of being in that neighborhood. You have a great story, um, about the early days and the, the work that went in. Uh, can you can you give us mm -hmm. right before we press the record button? You mm -hmm. told me a bit about it. I'd love to hear mm -hmm. it on air about the the early days and what it was like mm -hmm. to get that first coffee house up and running. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that uh, people not forget their history. <laughs> and uh, with us, there was a business reporter in the coffee house one day, and he was interviewing other businesses, not us. But I happened to be working behind the counter, and I would, as I was serving drinks, make comments about our business and what what it took to really open and stay in business at that time. And we were not even a year old. And I happened to mention that we slept on the shelving in the basement of our coffee house. And we would take turns because of the number of hours we were working. And we only had one employee. And one day, Aaron, the staff member who I'm trying to track down now, Aaron, if you're there, last I knew you were in Vermont, we'd love to find you for the 25th. Um, perfect first employee because Aaron went downstairs and did not know that at different times we were taking naps and all she saw was an arm coming off a shelf and came back upstairs and uh, the comment made to me was, I don't need to know everything, but a little more information would be helpful. So as I was sharing this with the business reporter, the next day he called and said, I think you all are, are my story. And we discussed all the research we had done and the paper comes out and the headline is The Slab of Success. And it's about sleeping on the shelving and that it was like living in a morgue. But it really reinforced that what does it take to 
to create a business and what are you willing to sacrifice? And I don't even like the word sacrifice. You know, to what lengths will you go to make sure your business launches and many years later stay in business? Sure. I think it's great to hear because I think everyone has a story like that, but it often doesn't get told when you sort of gloss over and say, yeah, you know, we started and it was tough and kind of move on and talk about the successes. Uh, I know personally when we started Chenmark, uh, my brother, my sister and I, uh, we didn't get a paycheck for multiple years. Uh, and I think people were sort of scratching their heads of, you know, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? And for us, you know, we always were very comfortable with the long-term payoff of what we're doing because we were bought into it and didn't, to your point, didn't seem like a sacrifice at the time, but to everyone else, it seemed absolutely nuts. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess that's, we that's lived, the nature of the entrepreneur. It is. And, and, you know, we lived on very little money because we kept reinvesting and we kept, then we started hiring people because initially we, we did only have one staff member and actually she was part time to begin with and became full time very quickly. The one thing we had not, you know, with all of our projections and as organized as we, we were, we had projected 25 customers a day from the beginning because it was a neighborhood that again had been somewhat forgotten. People were a little nervous to come to it. But there were all of a sudden great restaurants and things happening. And we did not anticipate the day that we opened the State Theater, announced that Bob Dylan was going to tour again and tickets went for sale the first day. So we had 250 people our first day of business, which we have no memory of. <laughs> um, but what was really beautiful is when we celebrated our five-year anniversary as a business, we put memory books out and customers wrote about the first day. That's awesome. Which and was really incredible. So we do memory books every significant anniversary now. Sure. And now you're coming up on 20, on 25. So now we're videotaping people. Yeah. They get to talk. <laughs> so, so let's, let's flash forward then to, to the 25 year. You mentioned that you're the, the grandparent of coffee in Portland. Mm -hmm. Can you juxtapose CBD today versus CBD 25 years ago and how it's changed, mm -hmm. how it stayed the same and how you guys are, are reinventing mm -hmm. yourself to, to remain committed to your goal and into your mission of supporting arts and community and being a community builder in the area. Mm -hmm. I think what's really important, and I encourage any business just launching today, have a mission and vision statement. They will be your guiding light. And you'll have, if you're like us, you have the good fortune of many opportunities offered through the years. We have had chances to grow much faster and we've turned them down. And at the time when people questioned it, or the neighborhoods we move to and people question because that part of town, it really serves as your, your guide. You, you won't necessarily have all your numbers right. You won't necessarily have everything. But if you know the core values of who you are as a company and where ultimately you want to be, vitally important. And so I think that when we have become older as a business, the, the mission and vision have obviously led us. But then how do you reinvent yourself? So there's that customer who may not be stepping through your door. How do you present yourself in a different way without changing who you are? And so around five years ago, we started noticing as the third wave of coffee, the, the younger coffee companies that focus on coffee siphons and we offer origin coffees, but they were presenting them in a much more um, targeted way. And we started to feel old. And over the years, Alan and I have had various anniversaries of the business where we've questioned, are we meant to be doing this? Are we still the ones who should be leading this company? Are we still valid as an entity, as a company? And and I have to say five years ago was probably the most challenging of all because we really had to think about, were we old? And what does that mean? And were we really at the top of our game still? And so we decided, it actually started out Really pretty innocently, we hired a graphic designer and said, redesign our packaging. And good for us, we hired the right person because he came in and said, I could redesign the package, but it wouldn't fit in with everything else. Would you be open to a brand review? And so we worked with Mike Todorico, and he did a brand review, which included online interviews and on the street, anonymous interviews. And we did internal staff. What do you know about the company? What are you proud of? What do you not like? And out of that, there was, what do people know about Coffee by Design? And it was really interesting for us because there was certainly, you know, some things they knew. There was a lot they didn't know. And we realized things that we were doing behind the scenes that we kept very private, like our travel to origin and what we do as far as community work, both here and there. 
we weren't really talking about. And what we were learning through the interviews is people wanted to know what we were doing. The other thing that only Mike could get away with this is he said our logo looked dated. And as we said, is that a polite way of saying old? (laughs) And he he said, uh, the font's a little old. And we said, then tweak it. And he came back with five brand new logos for us to look at. And he really guided us through, uh, we're not changing who we, who you are. We're telling people more clearly who you have become. Yep. So how, how have you done that? Because you do have quite an impact on what I will call the, the supply chain throughout the whole process of coffee by design. So both, both domestically here mm-hmm. in terms of your impact on community and community building, but also abroad and talking about mm-hmm. coffee origin. Uh, can you talk about, it's always been a part of CBD. Now I think you're emphasizing it more, especially mm-hmm. over the last five years. Talk about how, how that's come about and what you've done to emphasize it more, but also share with the listeners what you guys do. It's, you know, it's interesting. I think that, you know, it, it's what we do overseas, but also how it circles back here. But what started is community involvement. You know, we really, and I'm very proud of this, became a voice for things that were happening here in Portland that no one wanted to talk about, um, AIDS, for example, or mental health issues. And those issues and people who were struggling with those issues were coming into our coffee houses on a daily basis. And so we really took the time to educate ourselves and and figure out how do we embrace and educate a community about these are our neighbors. As we started to travel overseas, really sourcing our coffee and getting a sense of we want to bring the best quality coffees here and we want transparency in what we're bringing back to our customers we really started realizing how can we select certain communities that we show it's about more than just a transaction. And so we started to identify projects that we really felt we could make a difference. So there's a wellness facility in Hardy in Columbia, for example, that we partnered. Um, it's hard for me to th- even think that we partner with the Colombian Coffee Federation, but we helped build a wellness facility. And to see within two years, infant mortality declined dramatically was really meaningful to us and showed a community it's not just about we're paying you for good coffee, but it's about we want you to have a quality of life that we want to have. Um, I'm very active with women in coffee. I um, focus primarily right now on Burundi and Guatemala and uh, and India, which people don't know there's coffee in India. There is, and it's a challenge sometimes to find the quality we want, but I really believe in the project and educating young girls on coffee farms so that they have opportunity to live good lives and in some cases go back to the farm and, and lead the farm. So it it really has shown us that you can still do business, you can still buy coffee, and we can let our customers know we want a good quality of life. But guess what? So do the partners we work with overseas. And in our small way, we can't save everybody or, or change the world. But I do believe we can change one cup at a time certain people's lives. Sure. So that, that last bit I'm going to pick up on because... Uh, it's something that you mentioned before we hit the record button. If, if you think of you and your team thinking about everything of, in terms of cups of coffee and how many cups of coffee does it take to do X, how many cups of coffee does it take to do Y? Uh, and there's sort of two parts to this. And one is the the uh, the social responsibility aspect of CBD cannot be furthered, cannot be upheld without the financial responsibility of CBD as a business. And, and we talked about the dichotomy of for-profit, not-for-profit, and the blending of the two and how mm-hmm. important they both are to serve each other. So can you talk about how um, either the stigma of of social responsibility coming sort of without any fiscal or financial or business backing and, and vice versa, um, because the reality is in order for you to extend your mission, you need to be able to sell cups of coffee. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think it's interesting. Years ago, someone asked if we, and we called it social responsibility at the time. Now it's sort of trans, transitioned into sustainability, which has a very different feeling to me. I really love social responsibility because it really does have to do with people, planet, and profit, the three-legged stool. And, and so it's really near and dear to who we are. And someone asked, would we have grown faster as a company if we didn't run our company through that lens? And what I feel, and I am fairly certain Alan would agree with this, is we wouldn't have coffee by design if we didn't have that lens. It is core to who we are. We wouldn't have the customers. We wouldn't be making the choices we make without that as 
our criteria. So do we need to know our numbers? Absolutely. I tell people sometimes, though, the choices we make to to make profit may differ somewhat, and sometimes it may be slower than some people like. I, we frustrate the staff sometimes, but why aren't we moving forward on that faster? And as we've explained, because we need to be able to afford it, and we want to make sure that when we launch it, it's done and it's done well, and it creates a stronger foundation than the one we've already built. So the numbers are always there. We have to be aware of them, but built into it is always a percentage of giving, who we buy from, and how do we raise awareness of letting our customer know it's not just about the cost of coffee that creates pricing. It's the cost of living here. Mm -hmm. So when they see in the newspaper coffee prices are declining, well, number one, that's not particularly good for the farmers (laughs) over there, but that doesn't mean our prices decline because we have a rising cost of living here. And I lately, it's been very much on my mind, how can I make sure that farmers have a quality of life, but how do I make sure the people who work here with me have a good quality of life also? Sure. <clears throat> that gets into the part of uh, when you're when you're for profit and you've been around for so long and you're so visible and you know we're here at your flagship location on Diamond Street, people are behind me coming through the doors left, right, and center. Uh, and the perception is that, well, there's there's cash everywhere as you guys are, are rolling in cash. So you can, you can serve all yeah. masters equally and you can grow to the, the nth degree, but that's obviously not really the case. So can you talk about some of the tough trade-offs or some of the hard decisions you have to make in order to grow sustainably within your vision and your mission statement? Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's interesting that it's, and I think that, again, the past five years where it was important for us is number one, how do we recreate the vision of who we are and the logo, every, no one calls us coffee by design. Everyone calls us CBD, which now has been very interesting, as you can imagine, with other things going on in the world with CBD. And we actually own the trademark, which we're trying to think of, does that mean we can pay the mortgage off sooner? <laughs> but, but I think that, uh, we, we had to really get our minds back. And Diamond Street is a really good example of money and when do you take risks and when have you earned the right to take big risks? And we were at that point at our Washington Avenue location. We were roasting there. We had a coffee house. We'd already moved the, the roastery once from India Street to Washington Avenue, swore we would never do it again, never need to do it again, and then realized we were maxed out in the space. And Alan and I both had to really do a lot of soul searching about, did we still have things we wanted to do with the business? Did we still have areas we wanted to grow? Were there things we still wanted to learn? Who was working with us? What opportunities were they looking for? And what we discovered is we would have been okay at Washington Avenue. We we wouldn't have been able to grow the wholesale company because we have our coffee houses and our wholesale business is the largest part of the business. Um, and it would have been fine, but it would have been stagnant. Mm-hmm. And so as we started looking at buildings that were available for sale on the peninsula, as people can imagine, it's not easy to find a building on the peninsula where you can roast coffee. And we had promised our staff we would always be downtown, that we would not be in an industrial park. And to be honest with you, Alan and I didn't want to be in an industrial park. We went to visit a few spaces and very rare that I cry publicly. I wept and said, if this is what we've created, I'm out. <laughs> I am wanting to be part of downtown, a vibrant community, and we need to find something. And so we were shown the building on Diamond Street, which is a 44,000 square foot building. At the time, Washington Avenue is 5,000 square feet. Um, we felt it was too big of a jump for us. And a few months later, when the building uh, had been under contract with someone else and then the deal fell through, we revisited it and said, at the rate that we are growing and with the ideas we have, let's go for it. And it really took me, I mean, I remember saying to Alan, this is where as entrepreneurs go back to where you were in the early days. I was just about to ask, did that give you flashbacks when, to the slab? And when you had nothing to lose, so you could risk. And now you're so afraid that the choices you make will impact so many people. And we need to get back to that mindset of we have nothing to lose. 
and that we believe in the vision, we have ideas, and it really comes down to if the bank will loan us the money, we do it. And so our bank partner at the time did agree to loan us the money, which was a fairly significant amount. And But it was as if they had been sold numerous times and now are a large national, and it was as if they didn't know us. The terms of the loan were really, you know, we felt did not show that that we had a proven track record as a business, that we had always paid our loans off in time, that we had actually always been conservative in our projections, always far surpassed, didn't live extravagant lives that we had invested over and over and over again. And at this point, we'd owned two of our other properties. And so the night before the closing, Alan came to me, and I was I will always be thankful for this. He said, I can't sign. And I said, good, because I can't either. And so we went to the seller who had already had two other deals fall through and said, we, please give us time. And he said, I, I'll give you a week. <laughs> and so, so we had a week to find $3 million. And the thing that was amazing to me, to both of us actually, is we had done our homework on what banks were poised to sell and what ones were not, that they were truly community banks. We met with five banks, most of whom we'd never even heard of here in Maine. Um, and said, if these are the numbers, this is what we're wanting to do, this is the vision, you have till Friday to let us know if you're going to loan us the money. And uh, much to our amazement, um, all five came back offering us a deal. And the one bank, uh, this amazing young man we worked with at Andrew Scoggin, that night he called because we didn't have time to call anybody to say, we're going with you, we, we're reviewing documents. And he said, obviously, I didn't get the business. How can I learn to do better next time so I could earn your business? And I tell people that story because make those calls because we gave him the business. We said it's not just about the deal. It's about a relationship. Mm -hmm. And we knew by his openness and how he could learn, he would want to learn about us. And so we went on with Andrew Scoggin Bank and have been with them since as a partner but I think that you need, there are those moments as a business that you need to understand that you're going to make mistakes and you do need to do your homework and you do need to make sure that you minimize those mistakes. I've always told people we've made many, many mistakes and we're willing to share them, but we really did our homework to make sure that they weren't mistakes of an impact that would basically put, the, put us out of business. Diamond Street was probably the first time when we were nervous that if we made a bad judgment call, it could have that potential. Sure. So, um, so how do you keep that mentality of we have nothing to lose when as a more established organization, a bigger organization, more people on the payroll, objectively, you you do have something mm -hmm. to lose. Uh, and I know probably that the thing we talk about at Chenmark the most isn't the number of companies that we've bought or our revenue, it's actually the number of people we employ. Mm -hmm. And across all six of our current portfolio companies, we employ about 450 people. And a lot of those companies cut payroll checks weekly. And that's scary, but also very meaningful for myself, my brother, my sister-in-law, where that is the best example of how tangible what we do today is. We, you know, we are supporting 450 employees. And it's very meaningful for us to say, yeah, on, on a weekly basis, that's money going out the door mm -hmm. for 450 people, 450 families. Um, but in order to evolve and in order to grow, you need to be able to continue to take risks, calculated risks, but still risks. So how do you keep that mentality while objectively having an organization that is that does have something to lose? I think it's twofold. I think obviously you need to know your numbers. So it's not that we're just throwing cash out the door. Uh, we actually, it's interesting as the rising costs here in Portland, it's become more challenging than ever because you want to offer a good wage, good benefits package. You want people to be able to own homes and have families. It's, it's really challenging when you're selling cups of coffee. And I think it's having those moments of allowing yourself to dream. And I remember years and years ago when we actually reached our five-year anniversary, we thought, well, that that's pretty cool because the failure rate is pretty high the first five years. And then someone shared with us how much higher the failure rate was the next five. And I'm like, <laughs> we hadn't heard that one. And so Better we, if you don't know, right? And at the time, we didn't have all the entrepreneurial services available now. I'm so inspired by what's available for services now. Although sometimes I worry that people feel they've got to scale up fast. And I tell people... 
it's not that we didn't want to grow and it's not that we don't want to grow, but we want to be a little more thoughtful and slower growth. So we're here for the long term. But I, it was really interesting that we started interviewing consultants because we wanted to talk about what the next five years would look like. And, and everyone we interviewed wanted to talk about numbers. And again, it's not that you don't need to be aware of them, but it didn't inspire us. And so we ended up meeting with a, a consultant who was a customer and we didn't know him well at the time. And he said, of course, we'll talk about numbers, but I want to talk about the mountain climb. We're like, okay, you've got our attention. And he said, you've been this amazing climb and it was really hard. And you're at the top of the mountain and the view is magnificent. But you see in the distance some other mountains that are really appealing. And there's some that you clearly don't want to travel to. And my job is to get you off the mountain you're on and go explore the other mountains. And we wrote our first vision statement out of that. And I think about that all the time. If you lose your ability to dream and we all, I, you know, I'm guilty. All of us, there are those moments when you just think everyone in the company is arguing with each other. And how did that happen today? And, and then you have to really sit yourself down and say, remember the beginning, but look how much there is ahead. Things we never dreamed we would do. If anyone had told me that I would be in Burundi, in a parade that they're doing in the honor of my business as a surprise. I just, you can't dream this stuff. So I can only imagine what's ahead. Same thing with Alan when he actually goes and sees a farm that we started with, working with early on, and to see that what they're creating, they're getting more money for, and the family is doing better. It's incredible. There are long-term relationships we have with coffee farms now, and we are all growing up together and hopefully living better quality lives. So I think that the biggest mistake as an entrepreneur you make is you you feel you don't have the right to dream anymore. And to me, that's the death of a business. Sure. No, that's a great way to say it. Um, so I want to, uh, you, you've talked about growth a couple different times now and how important it is to to think about growth in the context of your, your being everyone's personal mission statement, vision statement. Um, but also it, it's not, it's not binary either. Um, and growth is not, uh, specific just to you, right? Every uh, people around you are growing competition around you is growing talking about here in Portland, you mentioned the, the third wave of coffee, sort of the newer coffee mm-hmm. houses, the newer coffee establishments in Portland, which a little bit like craft brewing is, uh, is mm-hmm. a, a, a quickly growing segment of, of industry here in Portland. Mm-hmm. So can you talk a bit about the, the downside or the potential risks associated with being deliberately sustainable about growth when Mm -hmm. in the context of in Portland, you have competition around you that that's on your flanks Mm -hmm. and, and can in many cases move faster than we can with certain, I mean, cold brew is a really good example of that. You know, we've had cold brew for, for years. We've had cold brew and, and had the vision of doing growlers and canning and all of that. And, and I have to say, I'm very appreciative that we did not launch when we had planned to, because one of the things that's important is that particular category in our industry was growing so quickly that people were really not doing the homework they needed to. And and fortunately, as we were exploring our options, uh, I went to a coffee conference and decided to do the executive level courses, which I had not done before. And there was a whole segment on um, health issues and cold brew. If it's not bottled properly, really, like, and like what um, you can't put a you, what was happening is people were putting the product out there saying good for ninety days. Well, they hadn't done lab testing and didn't realize that day ten mold was forming if it wasn't um, packaged properly. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people were just you know packaging it, and, and even with us, it was interesting. I came back, and at that point, we had cold brew on tap. And we were definitely dating our kegs differently after that, that it was, you know, 10 days pull. Um, we stopped offering decaf. Decaf is a slow mover and we felt we really couldn't maintain integrity of the product. Um, and yet couldn't afford the loss of having to dispose of a keg after a week. So it, it really, you know, the, I would say 
cold brew in particular that I'm glad in some ways that we couldn't move quickly, but there were others out in the market way faster than we were building that niche. Um, I do, and, and it's frustrating for Alan and me, but for our staff, where we used to always be the lead on all of these things in our industry, suddenly so-and-so has already gone ahead and done it and, and having to be okay about that. Realizing that where we used to take pride in being the first, now realizing we may not be the first, but when we do it, we'll have done our homework and we'll launch it and launch it well. Sure. So now that we're doing, we have a great partnership with someone who does our kegging, their uh, USDA certified facility, which now actually for cold brew, if you're going to sell outside your coffee house, you have to do. Um, the growler launch is going extremely well. So frustrating. Yes. Not the first. Yes. Um, well done. Hopefully so. So I think, I think that's a lesson that's crucial because I think the, the expectation of the small business is the entrepreneurial business is the, is the fast mover. If, if we don't have anything, at least we're, we're small, which means we're nimble, which means we can move fast. And I think true, but it, it can come at a cost. Exactly what you're talking about of not being super thoughtful about what you're doing, not thinking about knock on consequences or, uh, not thinking through, mm-hmm multiple steps to look down and say, all right, well, as we scale, what happens to the bottlenecks in this process? How do we, how do we serve our, our clientele in a safe mm-hmm. manner effectively? It's funny because as entrepreneurs, we want to say yes. Um, no is really a powerful word. Um, you can't be all things to all people. And so really, again, getting very clear on who you are and looking at opportunities to grow. We've had many opportunities to grow much faster. Several years ago, we had the opportunity to go into the Boston market and it would have doubled us in a year. And we said, no, why? it's way too fast. There's no way we can have the infrastructure. We just built it. We just moved into Washington Avenue. Actually, we would have maxed out within the year. Uh, we had learned our lesson as we've grown that trying to bring staff along is really important. They have to be part of the transition plan as you grow. And in the early days when we had staff who thought we were only going to have one location, when we opened two, we lost a few people because now you're becoming one of them. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine we opened three and then we opened wholesale. All of a sudden you're losing people who, wait a minute, you said you were going to be a small business. Well, we are a small business. No, you're not. You're big now. So how do you even define what's small and big at this point? Sure. Even now, I view myself as a small business. But for the state of Maine, I guess we're big. And Depends on perspective. It depends on perspective. And, and you know, but we do. How do you say no? And so there are opportunities, you know, probably one of our most, you know, we have so many great, powerful partnerships now that I think of that we said no to initially, and not because we didn't want the business, but we weren't ready for it. Mm-hmm. And L.L. Bean is a really good example. We opened the coffee house there. And actually, initially, we're not going to open any more coffee houses when L.L. Bean approached five main coffee companies. And we presented and said, I mean, they gave, there were no guidelines. It's, here's, there's a space. What would you do with it? And we said it would have to be under our name, that it would be our staff, that we would do the build out. We would obviously have to honor L.L. Bean. It's inside the flagship store. Never dreamed we would be given the opportunity. They did come back, offered it to us, but we were on a second floor all the way in the back in between Hunt Fish and the main store. So I don't know about you. I don't know a lot of people who will run into a store up the stairs across a building to get a cup of coffee. So it was a a learning few years, and we went back to L.L. Bean and discussed that we were maybe not going to renew. The numbers didn't work. And we're very fortunate that at the time we had to realize, number one, they had never co-branded with someone. So it was pretty big that they allowed someone else to have their name inside the store. So they needed to get to know us. We needed to get to know them. And they came back and said, we have an idea. So just sit tight. And six months later, the, uh, Chris McCormick was the uh, president at the time, had an idea about moving us. And it was going to move us to the lower floor on Main Street and that they were going to build a door onto Main Street first time in their history. And we're sitting there thinking, we can't afford the, we can't afford <laughs> yeah. this great idea. It's a lot of, but, a lot of cups of coffee. Thanks a lot. And, um, and the thing that was really 
amazing to us is because of the partnership and because L. Bean is very smart and had really done research and, you know, who is their customer and their customer, the, the average age was aging. And I laugh because they said, well, you know, 55. And I'm like, well, I'm 55. Don't talk about that being old at the time. And, uh, that they knew that they needed to really have some value added in the store and there needed to be a coffee house and there needed to be a cafe. They, you know, the, the cafe 1912 offering better quality locally sourced food. And, and so they, they said, no, the build out. Oh, and also the, oh, there was no water also on that floor. So coffee house water, you need it. Difficult. Um, so they, they did that part of the build out. They built the door out onto main street and they made sure we had access to water and we were able to move part of what we had built on the upper floor. And, and it was really an amazing partnership, but, out of that, there were other avenues at L. Bean, including our coffee was not being sold in their stores. And what was initially offered to us, we felt we could not agree to because they wanted it sitting in a warehouse for up to a year. And the margins they wanted were not in alignment with what we believe the price of coffee should be. Lower margin, more people able to access this product that brings us all together. We don't want it to be an elitist product. And everybody can appreciate good quality and should be able to when it's coffee. And so it took five years of negotiating. Talk about the long game. And the thing that's great about it is it ended up being a better launch because of it. We actually were not in Diamond Street at the time. We, during that time, moved into Diamond Street and now much easier for us to roast and palletize and ship what does need to be inventoried there. But the quality of the product was maintained. The pricing was within a structure that we felt comfortable with. So again, I think it's a matter of sometimes a no doesn't mean no forever. It means let's figure this out. Sure. And let's make sure when we do it that we maintain integrity of the brand, which ultimately for the staff here who either get frustrated by how long things take or, you know, we have to prove ourselves. I laughed. I said to someone the other day, do Alan and I for the rest of our lives have to prove to you all we really do care about the company and care about your well-being? We're always talking about you. You may not see us. We may not talk to you every day, but we talk about you all the time. The choices we make. Um, someone said that you used to share all the ideas and we've, we've really said some of the ideas and vision are bigger now and we don't want to present something we're considering until we have a little more information so that when we present to you, we're, we're, we're fairly certain we can do it and and we want to get your buy-in and we're willing to get feedback because you're the ones who have to implement it. But at the same time, they are bigger dreams. Mm -hmm. And so how do we make sure that we're prepared for it and that we as owners can support it? And then hopefully the team is behind it. Sure. So has it always been hard to say no? Is that something that you and or Alan have developed over time? Because it, it is not easy to see an opportunity, know it's an opportunity, see the possibilities, but have the wherewithal to have the patience to execute it the right way, your way, in line with your values. It, it's incredibly hard because in the early days, we need, I mean, we still do. We need every customer. And there isn't a day when I see someone come through the door that I'm not thankful for it. When I go to Congress Street and I see customers who have been coming for 25 years, it's incredible. I mean, we've grown up together. I love it. And and they have many choices. And that doesn't mean that they aren't supporting other coffee houses. And as I tell them, as long as it's a locally owned one, I'm really excited that you know it's important to support local. But but I think that it's the early, the early I'm, the first time we said no was really hard. We really wanted to take an account on and we knew that we did not have the structure in place to take it on. It would have been enough of a stretch. And we knew it would impact our current customers. And we thought we can't risk losing current customers. And we don't want to take on a new account that we can't serve well. And it was funny because we have several accounts that ended up, we had one account that actually three times we had to say no to. Every time they approached us, the timing was bad. And when they finally came on board, the feedback we got was we always wanted to be with you all because you weren't afraid to say no because you knew you could not serve me well. I knew when you finally took me on board, I would be served well. Powerful. So I think it's really powerful, but it, it, it's, it is. It's, and some people take it as judgment also. Sometimes they'll say we're not the right match. And having people understand it's not better or worse. It's a matter of 
you know, someone shared with me at Origin once, there is no waste in coffee. Every bean has its home. It's just a matter of which home does it belong in. And because some coffee you look at and you don't even recognize that it's really coffee. <laughs> and I thought that's really beautiful from a sustainability standpoint, but also the point of difference as a company that going out there and constantly searching. Um, there are always great new coffees out there these days because of environmental issues. The impact of global warming or whatever you personally believe in, agriculture is getting hit hard. And so we always have to be out there searching. But I think that the beauty of being able to let a wholesale customer know, um, and we, we have been told we've created probably the most difficult model you possibly could. We roast to order here. So when a wholesale customer places their order, we're roasting it for them. That what they'll get is freshly roasted, prepared specifically for them, and we want feedback. But it also means we can't take on huge accounts all the time. Diamond Street has changed it. Now we're able to scale up. But it took all these years to be in a position of saying, this is what it would take to scale up. And now we're ready. We've got everything in place. But let's still be thoughtful in who we're bringing in and how we serve them. Sure. Because, of course, we'd love to double in size and then pay the mortgage. <laughs> um, <laughs> who wouldn't? But but you lose your reputation. So it's a matter of how do you, again, keep that entrepreneur mindset of who are you? What are our core values? What's our buying criteria? We know what the end game is. We know what the quality of the product, giving back to our community, giving back to our the people who work here, hopefully making a little bit of difference at origin. Um, we hope that that's what, in the end, we'll have done here. Someone said to me years ago, and I loved it, they asked what difference, he was in agriculture, what difference will your life have made? What will you want people to say about you long after you're gone? And he said, I want a family farm to say we're still here because of you. That's awesome. I want to close off the interview with a couple of questions I ask everyone. Um, and I purposely didn't ask. I didn't tell you about these. Oh, uh, now I'm wanna, nervous. I want to I wanna get, yeah, I want to get the unvarnished answer. Okay. So the first one is uh, pretend you have a magic, magic pause button in life where you can hit pause and nothing's going on. You have four months to allocate. It's got to be coffee by design related. How do you spend that time when you're not getting distracted by anything else going on? You have four months of just blank slate. Oh, no. I mean, I would travel. I would, I, I, if I could go to coffee origin, uh, I mean, this year I had two trips canceled for various reasons. I think that if I can't be out there learning as much as I can about the product that we serve and share those stories, um, I, there are so many countries left to see and, and stories that need to be told. And I think as a company, we grow stronger when I can tell those stories. And then in some cases, actually bring those people here. Sure. So the next one, similar, a little bit different twist. Uh, you get a million dollars to spend as you would like. Also coffee by design related. It's got to be furthering the mission in some way. How do you spend that money? It's funny. People have asked if I won the lottery, would I stop my job? And I laugh um, because now I would just do it better. I would do it better. And I think the, the most critical thing would be for the people who work here. I would really love to be able to offer more opportunity financially. Um, we have a really good benefits package and a, and a decent pay scale here and, and keeping good people here and making sure that they can have a quality of life that they want to have is vitally important. I would also like to bring more staff with us. We have a certain number of staff over the years we've brought with us to, to experience coffee. Um, we've actually surprised at, at origin, so at origin. Yeah. It's been great. And it's as much as you can tell someone about it when you take them there. It's, and it, we even have surprised. It was funny. We decided a few years ago to surprise our, some of our early wholesale accounts and bring them with us. And I'll never forget. We called one account and it's very rare that Alan and I together will call an account now. And he was driving the weekend and he pulled off the side of the road. He thought he'd done something wrong. I'm like what power that has that a wholesale customer is worried they've done something wrong to offend us. And, uh, we told him that we were going to bring him and we were going to pay for the whole trip. And, and it was just, it's really amazing when you have the opportunity to bring wholesale accounts also 
who you, you know, but you don't know personally on the level that you want to. And I've had some of the most amazing conversations and have so much respect for the other entrepreneurs who we have the good fortune to sell our coffee to and to have them see what we do, reinforcing our vision and our criteria and to share that with them is really amazing. Um, so that it, that's, that's been huge for us. I would bring more staff and I would bring more customers. Awesome. The last one, the most open-ended, the easiest on me, the hardest on you. And I learned this from my first boss. So Dave Macaron, if he's listening, Mm -mm. shout out to you. What haven't I asked that I should have? That is a good one. You know, I think what's really important to me is that customers... You know, it's a really interesting time to be in business and it's a really interesting time to be in America. And I think that asking people to allow a business like ours to continue to grow, to show the role that we feel we can play as, I, I, I call us citizens of the world, that small business can actually really make a difference in our community. I would ask people understand the importance of locally owned business. I am a co-founder of Portland by Local. It's really important to me that we maintain our identity as a community, and that's through the businesses we support and grow here. I, I tell people I'm not anti-big business, but I think there are certain communities and parts of downtowns that should be protected. Um, it's level the playing field. Sometimes I feel there are things offered to big business that aren't offered to small. And so give us an opportunity so that when someone comes to Portland, Maine, they understand who we are as a community, who we are as a people that you can't find anywhere else in the world and allow us to welcome the new customer who comes through our door who may not have been born here. The one thing that really came full circle for me within the industry is we started with our local community. We then reached out to our origin and then one of the, I told people, people actually three years ago, my life changed in the company because we brought a coffee in from Burundi. And I honestly don't even know myself if I could tell you where Burundi was at the time. All I know is we had an opportunity to bring in a coffee. It tasted great. I was fascinated by the country. Alan and I both thought, wow, how, how can we maybe play a, a bigger role here? And we decided to have a welcome ceremony for the coffee. We'd never done that before. And I said, great. Turns out our representative from the women's group in Burundi is going to be on the West Coast. Let's bring her here to Maine. We're offering the coffee. We'll welcome the coffee. We'll have Isabel here. I'm telling the idea to someone, and they said, you know, there, there's a fairly large Burundi community here in Portland. And I said, really, I didn't know that. So why don't you have the Burundi representative? Welcome the coffee and welcome Isabel. And gee, there are these Burundi drummers that are sort of important, and we have happen to have them here in Maine, too. And cool. I'm going to hire the Burundi drummers. And, and so I'm flying back from Seattle and our event is that week. And, and the mayor of Portland, uh, Michael Brennan at the time was going to, going to give Isabel the key to the city. And we're going to have this Burundi representative I've never met. Welcome her. And I get an email from the Burundi representative saying, can you send me the CV of who I'm welcoming? Because I want to know who she is, but also I need to make sure she's not politically motivated. Never had been on my radar that I would even have to think about that. And so I sent the name and the resume back, and he said, um, I, we're okay. Um, she was my biology teacher 25 years ago. No way. Did not even know that she was still alive. And I, that moment I said, I think something pretty amazing is going to happen. And so Isabel arrives. We have the Burundi drummers out front. Um, I encourage people to look at our our on Facebook and on website, we have the video. It's an amazing day that we had. And the drummers and Isabel arrives in, in tears. And this is a woman who literally just a few years before, and she's older than I am. She didn't speak English when I'd met her just a few years before. And here she is leading the way in coffee for women in, in Burundi. And she sees Alain Neymana, who's the Burundi representative at the time, who now not only is one of my closest friends, but is the executive director now of the Greater Portland Immigrant Welcome Center. He's there welcoming her. Three other people step forward during the event, her students also. And I realized in that moment that how we define community is bigger than you can imagine. And that here in a cup of coffee, 
people who may never see their home again, I can actually bring home here in a cup. You know, fast forward two years later, I actually was supposed to go to Burundi that summer and the political situation made it impossible for me to go. And so I did end up going a year, two years later. And I'm there and meeting people. And usually if I say I'm from Maine, people want to know if that's in America. And I'm in Burundi and I say I'm from Maine. And I'm about to say that's America. And someone said, by chance, are you from Portland? No way. <laughs> and I'm in a remote region. And, and I met people's, I mean, mothers, aunts, family members, people they may never see again. And I'm bringing gifts back here to Portland from their family. And so it showed me coffee. It has deepened our understanding of what a community coffee company means. It has shown me we have so much more we can offer. And it has shown me that as people come through our doors, all are welcome and that you can make a difference one cup at a time. Come full circle. So I think that's a, that's a great thing to end on. Mary Allen, thank you very much for the time. I'm looking forward thank to you. the 50th anniversary thank 25 you. years. Oh, let's think about that. Yeah, that sounds good to me. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Big Time Small Business Podcast. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review and share the show with a friend. To access show notes and subscribe to our distribution list, be sure to visit us at chenmarkcapital.com slash podcast. That's chenmark, C-H-E-N-M-A-R-K, capital.com slash podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at chenholdco, C-H-E-N holdco. Last but not least, we'd love to hear from you, so please drop us a line at podcast at chenmarkcapital.com. Thanks a lot.